Good morning. And so uh, one of the lines that jumped off the page of the gospel for me this morning was, my heart is moved with pity for the crowd. You know, the, the, that Christ, if you will, looks at the world and he's moved with pity for us. And so he's going to provide something for us. And these things in the gospel, particularly in a, in a very, you know, I hope it's a way that's obvious to us all, in a very rich way, these miracles of the loaves and the leftovers and Jesus wanting to feed us is all pointing toward the Eucharist, towards our ultimate satisfaction. Man does not live or man and woman does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So there's something about us that can be satisfied by earthly things. It says they ate and were satisfied, but they're gonna be hungry again. And if we take this story and we remember the version of it in the gospel of, of, of John, he feeds the people in the gospel of John they go looking for him and he says to them, you're looking for me not because you saw a miracle, but because I satisfied your flesh. He said, work for food that does not perish. And he's talking about, you know, the eternal food of the spirit. Now, his heart was moved with pity. There's something pitiful about having not eaten for three days, right? Say, yes, Father Mike, <laughs> that's right. You would want some pity from the Lord if you had not eaten for three days. That's for sure. There is something painful and difficult about poverty. There is something that is, you know, really to be, to be run away from, to, to strive for us to help relieve other people of poverty and to work with all of our our strength to, to get out of poverty ourselves. But you know, I heard this saying, you've heard this saying, money doesn't buy happiness. Anybody here ever heard that? Yes, but the lack of it sure makes you miserable. Have you heard that, that part of it? You know, and, and you know, economists and people that study these things and sociologists, they've kind of come up with a number that once you have reached this much income, and it's not that high, anything beyond that really does not increase your, your, your well-being. If you have less than that amount and you're always worried about your bills and you're worried about being able to provide medical care, if you're worried about having a roof over your head and fixing the air conditioner when it breaks, yes, that, that brings a certain stress and difficulty to life. But once you've reached that point, then more money doesn't make you any happier. Doesn't mean, a lot of times it makes you less happy because you start worrying about all your stuff. We have a tremendous tendency, this is part of our human nature, and it's getting me to the first reading, and I don't want to go on and on and on and on, but I'm going to go on a little bit since I have the women's prayer breakfast and it's a special occasion, okay? Jeroboam thought to himself, this kingdom will return to David's house unless I do something. Solomon had really messed things up. King David had a son, Solomon. Solomon became the king and he really messed things up. Solomon's two sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, both wanted to be the king. Well, they couldn't both be the king, so they divided the kingdom. So we have the northern kingdom ruled by Jeroboam, and we have the southern kingdom ruled by Rehoboam. Jeroboam was very worried that his people were going to start going back to Jerusalem and worship God at the temple in Jerusalem. So what did he decide to do? It was in the reading this morning. So he said, if this people go and offer sacrifice to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, their hearts will be re desire to uh, return to their master Rehoboam. He's afraid of losing his people. So he takes counsel with his people and he does something, and I hope it leapt 
into your ear when you heard it this morning. What did he do? He made two of something, not just one, but two. If you missed this, shame on you. He made two golden calves, not one, two. And he set one in the northern part of his kingdom and he set one in the southern part of his kingdom and he established a temple to go there and worship the gold. To worship the gold, to ask the gold to do for us what only God can do. God wants to satisfy the deepest part of our being. We've set up lots of golden calves in different ways. The golden calf isn't just about money. It's about money. It's about power and it's about sex. That's what the golden calf symbolizes, those three things. And those three things are, are not the only things that we will put before our Lord, but there are, they, they're, they, they're a big chunk of them. And so Jerohobam understood human nature and said, if these people return to God, they're going to abandon me. Let me set up the golden calf, make it convenient for them, and they'll worship the golden calf, and they'll be lost, and they'll stay with me. Right out of the devil's playbook. My brothers and sisters in Christ, there is no doubt that uh, poverty can bring misery. And our Lord looks on us in our poverty and he will provide for us. But when we think the gold, the golden calf, those things will satisfy the deepest part of our soul, we have to hear this line in the gospel. They ate and were satisfied. And this was just a preamble to the true satisfaction of our soul, which is the Holy Eucharist, our union with God. We do not live by bread alone, but we live by the word of God. Jesus, the word comes to us today in the Holy Eucharist and let us pray today that it satisfy us. And let us pray today that we who have been blessed with much could be generous to those who have little and know truly the satisfaction of God.